my husband and I are from Indiana and we moved uh, to New Orleans for work. And we were just boyfriend, girlfriend at the time. And we had been, um, we had been living together for about six or seven years at the time. And he said, I really think that we need to, to find a church to go to. And so we tried a few others in the area. And then he said, you know what? There's this one I pass by on the way to work every Sunday. And I see that they have a lot of cars coming out of that parking lot. And anyone that needs someone to direct traffic must be doing the right thing. So, so we ended up um, Easter Sunday. We drove into celebration and I was all uh, gussied up because the church I grew up in, we needed to dress up to go to church. And so that's what, that's what we did. We were uncomfortable. <laughs> I heard um, singing. I heard the worship before I even walked in the doors. And it was awesome because there were greeters that just opened the door and everyone was smiling. And it was like they wanted me to be there. They were just friendly, it was really cool. And I had never had that experience before. And we went in and, and I, probably, uh, I probably started crying almost right away. And the service was amazing and it was, it was just a really beautiful Easter service. But to me, it was um, something really incredible because now I know looking back, it was the Holy Spirit that was just lifting everything off my shoulders that I had allowed to burden me for so long. I needed control over my own life and I was trying so desperately to have control over my finances and I worked so hard and that's all I knew. I didn't know that I could actually have a relationship with Christ. And then I read through uh, the Live book with one of my friends in my life group and a section of it was about baptism. And sure, I got baptized as a baby by my parents and I'm glad that they did that. But then I, I realized that I got to make the decision for myself to start this new journey with Christ and to show everybody, look, I'm making this commitment. Be, be the witness to this commitment that I'm making to Christ. Celebrate this with me. My life group stood there with me. My life group leader baptized me. My soon-to-be husband was standing there next to him. It was a, it was a really beautiful thing to have people that you love um, be around you and witness this thing that you're promising to do with Christ through this next step in your life. Let's turn over to our scripture passage we're going to look at today, which is Acts chapter 20. We finished this week our sermon series, which is titled The, the Blessed Life. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, and we covered the first eight teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And today we want to cover what we're calling the ninth Beatitude, and this is found in Acts chapter 20, verses 32 through 35. This is what it says in the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, Now I entrust you to God and the message of grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And now I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. And then he makes this statement, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I want you to circle that word blessed, and I want you to circle that word give. Now, here's the truth. The word blessed literally translates from the Greek language as happy. So you could translate this, a person is happier when they're giving than when they're receiving. Or you could say a person is happier when they're giving than they are when they are getting. Now, here's the reality. It says you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. The truth is, it is a blessing when you receive. Anybody here ever received a blessing from someone else? Someone blessed you and you were blessed by their giving. Of course, it feels blessed to receive. Most people focus their lives, though, on getting on receiving. It's why there were more prayers spoken the week that the Powerball was $600 million than in any other time in the history of the world. People were praying, Lord, if I would just win, I would be very generous, right? I had at least three people tell me, Pastor, if I win, I'm a tithe. I just thought that that was funny, right? And there were a lot of prayers of people focused on getting. Now, here's the truth. Getting, receiving is a blessing, 
But what I want you to realize is there's a higher way to live your life, and that's the higher blessing of learning to be a giver. Generous people are happier than stingy people. How many of you have realized this to be true in your life? See, the reality is when you learn to live a generous giving life, God blesses you for it and you're blessed for it. Jesus said that giving is far superior than receiving. Now, what can we give? Well, there's different things we can give. One, you can give your talents to the work of the Lord. Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that every Christian has been blessed with certain spiritual gifts and talents. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says that each one of you should use whatever gift you have received in order to serve others. Now, giving your talents to the Lord means that you make yourself available to serve in the kingdom of God. One of the opportunities we have on Easter Sunday with all the services we're going to have and all the people whose needs we need to meet and the people we want to greet and bless and receive and the children we want to minister to, we need lots of extra people to volunteer. Maybe one of the ways you need to give today is by signing up to volunteer to serve in one of our Easter services. We have a table in the foyer on the right side of the double doors right when you walk out where you can sign up to serve today. I want to encourage you to do that. Now, it is impossible for you to give your talent to the Lord without giving your time to the Lord. you got to make yourself available to God's plans and God's purposes, and the Lord will bless you for that. We can also give what's called our testimony to the Lord. Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Let's say that word witnesses together on three. One, two, three. Witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness testifies. A witness just gives their testimony of what God has done. Listen to me. Every one of you in this room needs to make yourself available to share the testimonies of how God is working in your life. Now, it would be great if there was a public forum where you could post your testimonies and all of your friends could read it. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's called Facebook. It turns out it does exist. Now, people post all kinds of things. They post articles. They post political things. Some people post Bible verses, but let me encourage you. When God does something in your life, post it publicly. Write it out. The girl Jamie, whose testimony we just read, God changed her life in a dramatic fashion. And for Christmas one year, she wrote a letter sharing the testimony of how God worked in her life. Part of, a significant part of her testimony is that I met with her and her soon-to-be husband. They're now married. They have a, a child together. They have moved up to, uh, back to Indiana. When I, when I met with them, we talked about how God wasn't able to bless them because they were living together and they weren't married. And she made the decision and he made the decision to go ahead and pull the trigger and ride the bullet and get married, Right? And after they did that, God began blessing their business, and God began blessing their relationship, and God began opening up all kinds of doors. And all she did was write this out in her testimony, and she sent it with her Christmas card. Hey, let me tell you how God worked in my life. Listen to me. People can argue with all kinds of stuff. Nobody can argue with your experience with the Lord. Share your testimony. Give your testimony to others. And then we can also give our tithes and offerings to the work of the Lord. The Lord said in Malachi chapter 3, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the church, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you won't have enough room for it. The word tithe means a tenth. It means to give a 10% of your income to the Lord's work and what the Lord's doing. I'll talk about this later on in today's message, and I'll challenge you a little bit in that. The truth is most people in the church today, most people in the United States of America, we don't do this. Listen to me, you can test the Lord in this, you can try the Lord in this, you can, you can see if the Lord will work out. The Bible only talks about testing the Lord 11 times. 10 out of 11, it says don't test the Lord. In the area of giving is the only area that God says, go ahead and test me and see what happens. I will bless you tremendously, I will bless you abundantly. And as a pastor, I have confidence in saying this to you. You know, we all make a living out of what we get out of life. But we really make a life out of what we give, out of the generosity that we're willing to pour to others. So today, I want to prove to you that giving is far superior than receiving. Because I'm looking at you, you don't believe me yet. 
So I'm going to show this to you, what the scripture has to say about it. Here's, here's three big ways that giving is superior to receiving. The first, if you're taking notes and filling in the blank, this is your first fill in the blank. Giving is superior to receiving because it breaks bondages in our lives. It breaks bondages. Now, people who are generous givers are free from three strongholds. The first is the stronghold of covetousness. Covetousness. Paul said in Acts 20, 33, we read this, I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. Now, covetousness or greed, as it's commonly known, is the uncontrollable desire to acquire, and it's a big stronghold in people's lives, especially in the United States of America. Most people in the United States of America think like this. If I just had a different house, then I would be happy. If I had a different car, I would be happy. If I had a nicer car, I would be happy. If I had a more expensive purse or certain shoes, then I would be happy. You know what? If I just had a different spouse, I would be happy. You know what? If I would have inherited money like that person, then I would be happy. If I would have just won that prize, then I'd be happy. You know what? If I could just go on that vacation, I would be happy. But here's the truth. No matter how much you get, you adjust, don't you? See, I like to say everybody can move from Toyota to Lexus, but very few people can move from Lexus to Toyota. Amen? See, we all think if I just had a little more, if I just had a little extra, if I had more money, $10,000 a year more, if I just made $10,000 a year more, then I'd be happy. Listen to me. Have you noticed everybody's way happier in the last month than they are the rest of the year? Have you noticed that? I haven't noticed it, yet it's tax return time. According to H&R Block, they're giving away thousands of dollars every week, right? But people aren't happy. You know why? We figure out how to spend that money quick, don't we? I don't know about you, I remember there was a day in time when I thought $1,000 was a lot of money. I don't think like that anymore. I can spend $1,000 on 10 different things before I leave church this morning. I can get on Amazon.com and spend $1,000 just like this. Matter of fact, I could use 3000 maybe even 10 You got some dollar amount in your mind though, that you think is a lot of money. I remember when I thought $100 was a lot of money. I remember my first job, minimum wage was four twenty-five an hour. You worked like 30 hours in a week and your check was $89. And I thought I was doing something, you hear? I was fresh with $89. But here's the truth, we all live like that. That's why credit is so powerful. Because people keep buying stuff they can't afford because they think they can afford the payments. But then the problem is you tear that thing up and it's already gone and you ain't even finished paying for it. Listen to me, I'm an expert at this. I spent $6,000 on a college degree I don't have. I paid it off for 10 years, just paid it off last year. Didn't even get the degree. You know how painful that is? $69 a month for 12 months, for 10 years, 120 months of writing that check. That gets old quick, right? I thought, can I return the debt since I didn't get the degree? No, you can't. And that's how life is. Coveting, unlike greed and lust, is a specific desire. It's a desire for what you don't have, and sometimes it's even a desire for what you can't have. You know, you can covet somebody else's spouse, according to the Bible. See, coveting is the tenth of the Ten Commandments, and it's the only one that gets specific. It says, you know what? Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet their servants. Don't covet their career. Don't covet their spouse. It says, don't covet their donkey which was their transportation, you know, don't covet their car, don't covet what they have, don't covet all these things because we all can find ourselves coveting, but when you become generous, you feel differently. You know, covetousness makes people miserable. They had this uh, Broadway musical that was made into a movie starring Rick Moranis when I was a kid, I remember it, and it was called Little Shop of Horrors. Anybody remember that movie, that, that musical? And it was about this uh, Venus flytrap that had a, a thirst for blood. And it was a little small plant, and it got a little bit of blood. And the more blood it got, the bigger it grew until it was needing to eat entire people. 
and he was trying to, trying to keep it on a slick and on a secret, and it would always tell him, feed me, Seymour. That's how your flesh is. The more you feed your flesh, the more you want. I mean, you ever been at like a, a party or something, and they had like a dessert? You know, something good, like, like strawberry cheesecake, or like white chocolate bread pudding, Oreo pie. You know, you're sitting there and you, you think, man, I'm just going to have a little bit. And you eat a little bit and you think, you know what that tastes like? More. That tastes like more. And then you go back for second and then you go back for third and that's your fifth donut. And your wife's going, is that your fifth donut? And you're like, no, no, no. It's my third one. And she's like, no, no, I know that ain't your third donut. You lying and now you eating donuts in the bathroom, you know, so nobody sees you eating donuts. See, here's the truth, and, and then what do you do? Then you feel fat, and then you feel guilty, and then you feel full of shame, and you're like, man, I wish I wouldn't have did that, and now you feel like pimples are breaking out because you had too much sugar. Here's the truth. That's how coveting is. The more you want, the more you desire, the more you feel yourself. No matter how satisfied, you just keep wanting more and more and more and more and more. You want, 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 because your flesh is never satisfied, and when you become a giver and stop focused on being a receiver, it frees you from the stronghold of covetousness. It also frees you from the stronghold of laziness. Paul said in verse 34, you know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. Listen to me, I'll tell you as a pastor, laziness is a stronghold in a lot of people's lives. How many of you know somebody who's lazy by show of hands? Yeah, how many of you know you're lazy? Right? Even if you work hard, you know there's just things that you do that a little lazy. Like, have you ever thought the remote was too far away so you just left the channel on that was on? <laughs> right? That's lazy, right? You ever, you ever dropped the ice cube, but then you just kicked it under the fridge because you didn't feel like bending down to pick it up? You're like, it's just water, right? It's going it, to, it'll go away, right? That's how you, you know you lazy sometimes. You ever hit the snooze button for like two hours straight? Am I the only person here? You just know you, like you ever been laying in bed and you want to reach for something? But you don't want to get out of bed, so you just like roll over and you try to stretch real far, and you'll pull a muscle once you get older, you know? And once you start feeling it getting tight, you just give up, and you're like, it ain't worth it, right? You ever go in Walmart and seriously think about riding around in one of them carts? <laughs> like, you really like, if, it would, if people didn't judge me, I would get in that cart straight up. And then you start thinking about limping on your way to it so people know there's something wrong with you just to prove that you're not just lazy. You ever like go to put something in the trash and the trash is overflowing but you don't want to take the trash out so you just throw it on the top and hope nobody notices? And you're like, maybe somebody else will come along and they'll be the one that takes it out and it won't have to be me. Am I the only person who's ever done these things? You know, I, I, I struggle with it. You ever go on vacation and you come back but you don't feel like putting all your clothes up so you just keep living out your suitcase for another week? <laughs> I remember one time we had a vacation a month later. We just left the suitcases out. We just left them packed for the next trip. You ever do your laundry and you got clothes in the dryer, but you don't feel like folding them, so you just keep taking them out each one by one as you need them? <laughs> dryer looks like it's sick. It looks like it's throwing up. Let me ask you, you ever use your stomach as a plate? Like you just laying on the couch and you just put the Cheetos right here. Am I? Okay, I guess I'm the only one on that one. <laughs> Look what the Bible says, Proverbs 13, 4. Lazy people want much but get little. Those who work hard will prosper. A lazy person's way is blocked with briars, but the path of the upright is open highway. A lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. And Ephesians 4 says, man, if you're a thief, stop stealing stuff. Start using your hands with something good and godly. When you start giving, you start looking at the world differently. You break the stronghold of laziness, and then you also break the stronghold of selfishness. In verse 35, it says, remember, you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. When you've got a receiving mindset, it's a selfish mindset. And listen to me, selfish people are always miserable people. Selfish people are always miserable people. They're never happy. Philippians 2 says, don't be selfish. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That way you can have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Listen to me, when you're a giver, when you're generous, it allows you to break certain bondages in your life. It also, giving is also superior to receiving because it allows you to build bridges 
with certain other people. Paul said in verse 35, I've been a constant example of how you can help those who are in need. Listen to me. God uses generous givers to do all the following things. To bring encouragement to those who are hurting. You know, people in our world are hurting. People in this world are jiggy-jacked up. They are struggling. They are depressed. Listen to me. Everybody knows somebody that's on some medicine, right? Some of you, that's where you at, right? I mean, antidepressants, anti-anxiety. I'm not saying you need to just get off your medicine, but what I'm telling you is a lot of this comes from people who are not happy and not satisfied and not content with their lives because their focus is on getting and not on giving. And generosity has the power to encourage so many people. And a lot of people that are in your life, they need that encouragement and they need you to be a giver. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord has come upon me. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to set the oppressed free. We believe that every single one of us as Christians, we should be participating in that ministry. And there's nothing that gives you the opportunity to bring encouragement and freedom to somebody else like being generous to them. It also allows us to bring equipping to those who are growing. You know, as a church, when you give to our church, one of our focuses is to equip people to grow. That means to train them, to help them, to encourage them. One of the things we do on mission trips, I'm leading a mission trip to the Dominican Republic later this year. We're going to train lots of pastors. We're going to equip them to be better ministers and better leaders. And we want to equip every single one of you in here to know how to be a powerful Christian. It takes resources to do that, and when you give, that's what you're giving towards. It also brings empowerment to those who are serving. Listen to me, there is nothing that frees you. There's nothing that connects you like being able to understand and realize that God wants to use you to make a difference and an impact in the life of somebody else. When people become givers, it empowers them. It allows them to see that God is working through them and using them in the lives of somebody else. And then God uses what we're given to bring enlightenment to the people who are perishing. You know, people are dying. People are dying, slow deaths. We don't realize it, but all around us we see people dying, decaying, destroying. The problem is we don't see it on the outside. I remember when I was uh, about 10 years old, I grew up in Gentilly. Not far from where I lived was the corner of Fillmore and Elysian Fields. And they used to have Lawrence's Bakery, the home of the wedding cake. Boy, I used to get them twist donuts, change your life, I'm telling you. I remember it as a kid, and two doors down from Lawrence's Bakery, they had a house, and I was riding with my dad one day, and as we got past the house, all of a sudden, it was covered in a blue tarp. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what's the big blue tarp over the entire house for? He said, oh, well, son, that house has termites. They're trying to deal with the termites. And I just remember thinking as a young child, you know, that's the problem with a lot of people. Everything looks good on the outside. House looks straight from the outside image looks good but on the inside it's getting eaten up termites just tearing it apart what happens if those termites finish their job the house looks fine one day and then somebody leans on the wall the next day the whole house comes crumbling down that's how people are people are falling apart they're dying they're miserable they're struggling they're literally decaying they're perishing and they need somebody to restore sight to their blindness they need somebody to bring healing to their broken heart they need somebody to help them in the midst of what they're going through that's what church and ministry is all about listen to me I can promise you one thing it doesn't matter how many issues you have when you walk into this church we're gonna love you we're gonna pray for you we're gonna minister to you we're not gonna judge you We're going to bring you encouragement and hope and healing, and we're going to stick with you until Jesus is finished changing your life. We're going to be patient. We're going to suffer for a long time. We're going to grind it out with you, and it doesn't matter how far you have to go. We're going to walk with you all the way. And even if you try to shake us off, we're going to stick with you. Even if you try to run us off so you can say, I told you so, y'all didn't really love me, we're not going to let that happen. 
Because we all need encouragement. We all need enlightenment. We all need somebody to bring the life-changing message of Jesus. Not just for this life, but for our eternal life. And to realize people need to be restored and reconnected in their relationship with God. That's why we're telling you we want you to bring somebody for Easter. Because we want you to bring the people whose lives need to be changed. I mean, you know somebody whose life needs to be changed. Look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in your mind the person you're going to invite for Easter or the group of people. I want you to think, all right, I need to fill up all the seats on my row, right? So if you're on a row with like 10 chairs, 12 chairs, that's how many people you need to fill up, right? For me, it's easy because I got six people in my family already, so I just need like four more. If you came solo, that's a lot of inviting you need to do, okay? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be praying for those people. So let's, let's as a, a church family, let's pray for one another. Now, here's what I want you to do, though. I don't want you to be selfish. I want you to be generous. So I don't want you to pray for you. I want you to pray for the person next to you. You might not even know their name. You might not even know who they are. You might never even seen them before. But I want you to pray for the people they're going to invite that God would make their hearts good soil. Would you do that with me? All right, well, let's pray. Father, we just pray for the people around us, Lord. We pray that the people they're going to invite would receive their Easter invitation. We pray that they would show up and come to church, and we pray that you would speak to them and change their lives. We pray you bring them hope, and healing and encouragement and we pray that you would work in their hearts let us not be selfish but let us be generous not just in our finances but in our prayers and in our time considering others more highly than we consider ourselves we pray for those everyone else is going to invite in the name of Jesus we pray I feel like I got to train y'all like my kids. At the end of the prayer, we say, Amen. all right, we getting it, okay? Here's the last thing you need to realize. Giving superior to receiving because it brings blessing to our lives. In Acts 20, 35, Paul said, I want you to remember, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, now how do we get blessed by the Lord? Well, there's a few things. When you give generously, the Lord brings affection to your life. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. The Lord loves everybody, we know that, but he especially loves those who are generous. That's what it says in this passage. It also blesses us with God's provision. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God will generously provide all that you need, then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. See, this, this is the way it works. When you're giving faithfully to the Lord, it frees you to have faith that God is going to take care of you. I do a, a, a Bible study at this company during the week, and the company had been having some struggles, and they had some layoffs, and some people they need to let go. I have a lot of friends that have worked there. I've talked to a lot of people there, and as kind of a a chaplain to the place. It's not really my title, but just kind of ministering to people who are there. I've had several experiences. I have two friends that work there. Both of them are tithers. Both of them are generous. Both of them are givers. And I talked to one of them today, and I said, hey, man, what's, what's the situation with your job? He said, well, I'm really secure. The Lord bless me. I'm on a contract. Things are set up. I'm good to go. God's taking care of me. I'm so blessed and how faithful the Lord has been, and he's protected my finances. He had such faith when he was talking about it. I said, man, that's awesome. I talked to another person that works there, and they actually got let go from the company. But they're tither, they're generous, and this is what they said. They said, you know what? Even though I know I got let go, I know the Lord's going to take care of me and open up another door because I've been faithful. So here's what happens. The circumstances don't dictate how you feel when you've been faithful and generous to the Lord. But when you haven't been faithful and you haven't been generous to God's work, when you go through struggles, you don't have the faith to believe that God's going to take care of you because secretly you don't think he should. You think, why is God going to take care of me? It is such a freeing and faith-filled moment when you're generous to the Lord to believe God is going to meet all of my needs. God's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about my job situation. I don't have to worry about what's happening around me. I've been faithful to the Lord, and God always blesses his faithful people. Amen? Amen. The Lord blesses you with that. Listen to me, that is a liberating and freeing moment. I know people that have good jobs. They live every day stressed out because they're not faithful to the Lord, and so they don't think that the Lord's going to be faithful to them. 
You also get godly appreciation from other people. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11 and 14, it says, when they take your gifts from those, we're going to take the gifts that you give and give it to those who need them, and they'll thank God, but then they're also going to pray for you for the deep affection that they have because of the overflowing grace that God has given to you. You know, when you bless somebody else, they appreciate what you've done, and you think about it. How far would you go to bend over backwards to serve and help the people that have been generous to you? It should be far. You think, you know what, I have such appreciation for how generous they've been to me that I'm willing to return that. It's the reason why so many parents struggle with teenage children. Because you've spent your whole life sacrificing for them, and are they grateful? No, they think you owe them another pair of Jordans. Right? I need this outfit. I should live here rent-free. Right? Why should I have to contribute for toilet paper? They eat you out of house and home, right? Listen to me. We all should have appreciation for the people who are generous to us. And then lastly, it brings great satisfaction to us. This is an amazing Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2. The churches in Macedonia are being tested for many troubles, and they are very poor. But they're also filled with abundant joy. Now, this is not a Bible promise. This does not say, if you give and you're poor, you'll still have joy. There are Bible verses that talk about that, like you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. This is actually the testimony of a church in Macedonia that was giving to the work of another church. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. You know, these people who are giving, they're all poor, but they're filled with great joy because they've been so generous because generosity produces joy. Now, I want you to understand this. This right here, at its crux, is why most people struggle with Christianity. How many of you know somebody that won't become a Christian because they know some? How many know what I'm talking about? Now, do you know what most people's biggest problem is with Christianity? This is what most people say. Most people say, well, I don't like Christians because they're all... Hypocrites. How many of you have ever heard that by show of hands? Can I just tell you that's not actually the problem? It's a misassessment of the problem. You know why most people who know Christians don't want to become Christians? Because the Christians that they know are not happy. That's the reason why. Because they look at the Christians and they think, well, your life's just like mine. Why should I give up what I'm doing to have the same misery you have? Do you know why the Christians are not happy? Because they're not generous. Do you know during the Great Depression, the average person living in the United States gave away about 3.5% of their income? And today, the average person living in the United States gives away about 2.5% of their income. That's to anything. That's to homeless people on the street, to nonprofits or charities that they support, to the Salvation Army, to the churches. Like total giving is 1% less now than it was during the Great Depression. Can you believe that? It's true. Statistically. We know this from tax returns. This is not made up. This isn't like we, we talked to three people and this is what they said. This is according to the United States Census. Listen to me. People who are not generous are not happy, and there's a lot of Christians who are not generous. That's why it's my job as the pastor to talk to you about this. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves can't break in and steal because wherever your treasure is, that's where the desires of your heart will be. No one can serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. So here's the deal. As a pastor, I would prefer not to talk about money. But this is actually one of the most important topics I can talk about in the United States of America because most people are not generous. Most people are focused on what they are getting. But you're far more blessed when you give 
than when you receive. So if I want the people in our church to be happy, I need to talk about this. Now here's the three most important ways you get blessed. Think about this. First off, when you give to the kingdom of God, you're storing up treasure in heaven. Now I don't know whether you realize this, but in heaven, all will not be equal. Rewards will be passed out based upon your generosity. Now here's my goal. My goal is that you are making a very good investment in heaven. That way when you get there, you're not mad at me. You understand? I don't want you having some little Rudy Pooh house. Everybody else has got a mansion. You over here in a little shack cutting grass. You can't get brand name stuff. You on uh, you know, great value. You don't have Cocoa Puffs. You got Cocoa Circles. You mad at me because I didn't tell you to store up your treasure in heaven. That's one way you'll be blessed. Here's the second way. You'll be happier when you're giving than when you're receiving. So I'm actually trying to help you be happy. Here's the last thing. God blesses generous people. Can I tell you what's amazing? Generous people are never struggling because God takes care of them. You think about this. God has unlimited resources. Who is he going to give them to? You think about it. Who's he going to give them to? Generous people. Not stingy people. So you got to become generous because that's what brings blessing to your life. Amen?